Are you ready to make the most of your oil and gas mineral rights? Welcome to the Mineral Rights Podcast. Get the knowledge and resources you need to manage your minerals and royalties. Here is your host, Matt Sands. Hello and welcome to the Mineral Rights Podcast. I'm your host, Matt Sands, and I'm here to help you make the most of your mineral rights and royalties. And Justin Williams is here with me as well. Hey, Justin. Good morning, Matt. Good morning. And I definitely need more caffeine, Justin, like we were talking before we uh, started recording. I just had published our first part of our listener Q&A episode, and we were talking before we hit record that uh, I thought I'd exported all of the different tracks, but apparently I just exported the outro. So if you tuned in right when that episode dropped, I apologize. There was only 15 seconds. Uh, We've got it fixed here by the time you're listening to this. And so uh, make sure that I drink another cup of coffee before I hit publish again. So, But uh, today we're going to talk about the next episode in our series on the major basins and plays in the United States. And so today we're going to talk about the Haynesville Shale which has been in the news lately, Justin, because of the refocus onto natural gas. Uh, Yeah, man, I've seen it in the news. Um, This was an area I really was not familiar with. So I'm interested to take a dive here and learn more about it. Um, So the Haynesville Shell is an informal popular name for the Jurassic period rock formation that underlies large part of southwestern Arkansas, northwestern Louisiana, and east Texas. It's one of the most important shell gas plays in North America because resource estimates put recoverable natural gas in the hundreds of trillions of cubic feet. It is considered a dry gas play. It is considered a dry gas play, which means that there are not a lot of natural gas liquid liquids produced with the gas. It is near what is called Arklatex region. Uh, this is where three states, Arkansas, Louisiana, and Texas meet. You've heard of the four corners. This is the three quarters. Uh, Matt, do you want to talk a little bit about the geology? Yeah, so the geology for the Haynesville is pretty straightforward. Uh, We've talked about some of these other basins with uh, various stacked plays and all these different reservoirs that are being targeted. This one's pretty straightforward. Like I said, it's uh, really targeting the Haynesville formation. And like Justin mentioned, the Haynesville Shale itself is the common name for a Jurassic period rock formation that is part of what they call the Haynesville and it contains two formal subdivisions, and geologists call these members. And the two members are the Gilmer limestone, which is also called the Cotton Valley limestone, and the Buckner anhydrite member. Now, we talked about the Haynesville, and that is really the main formation that's being targeted. And in addition to that, there is the Bossier Shale. And the Bossier actually lies directly above the Haynesville but under the Cotton Valley sandstones. And because of this, geologists consider the Haynesville and Bossier one and the same. So we talk about Haynesville throughout this episode. Just know that we're talking about the Haynesville and Bossier together. And the Haynesville is also bounded on the bottom by the Smackover Formation. And to get into the specifics about the geology, Geologists have taken a look at the Haynesville and determined that it's a heterogeneous mudstone. And all that means is that it's a fine-grained sedimentary rock that originally consisted of clays or muds. And yeah, I took a little bit of a look at the geologic history of the area. And like a lot of the United States and a lot of these major basins and plays, this was underwater back in the day. So you have these deposits of clays or muds. And this got deposited over time and buried very deep. And in fact, the Haynesville is one of the deeper formations currently being targeted, and it lies at depths of 10,500 to 13,000 feet below ground. So it is very deep, but it's also pretty thick. Uh, It's around 200 to 300 feet thick. And like Justin mentioned, it contains vast quantities of recoverable natural gas. So shale formations like the Haynesville in the past were typically thought of as source rock, as well as the cap and the basement rock layers that trapped oil and gas in a conventional reservoir. So if you think about a conventional oil and gas reservoir, just to review, like we've talked about in these other episodes, you have what's called the source rock, which is used to be considered these shale layers where a lot of times the source rock, the oil and gas would migrate up through the more permeable layers 
until they hit another cap, uh, whether that's a geologic cap or another layer, like another shale layer, and it would accumulate there, and that would be considered what, an oil and gas reservoir. And so when geologists look at seismic data, they would try to look for these traps and seals and places where they thought that oil and gas might accumulate, and that was historically how oil and gas was targeted. Now, at the beginning of the 2000s, with the advent of horizontal drilling and hydraulic fracturing, you know, in general across these shale basins, they were determining that they could actually target what was originally considered the source rock, and that is the primary resource now that they're going after. And again, that was the case uh, as well in the Haynesville until around 2008, when they suspected that there was a significant amount of gas in the Haynesville, but really not an economic way to produce it, and certainly not by drilling vertical wells. And in conjunction with the Henry Hub natural gas spot prices peaking at $12.69 in MMBTU in June of 2008, uh, Chesapeake decided to drill some exploratory wells in the Haynesville and use both horizontal drilling and hydraulic fracturing together to see if they could extract the gas in a cost-effective manner. And it worked, and this kicked off a rush to lease up the acreage that was prospective for the Haynesville shale. And by 2010, just two years later, the Haynesville had the most natural gas drilling rigs active uh, in any part of the country. Now, a lot of things have changed since then, but as we're going back to having natural gas prices start to come up again, operators are taking another look at the Haynesville, and that's where you're starting to see activity pick up again. So again, we have this shift in st operator strategy since 2008, 2009, uh, when price of natural gas dropped, and then operators started to shift towards oil as the price of oil came up. And the operators that were trying to rebalance their portfolio to have more of a mix of liquids and oils versus just pure natural gas, a lot of them divested their Haynesville interests. And so these assets have really changed hands a lot of different times. But again, since it's back in focus, Due to the bullish outlook in natural gas in 2020, uh, we're starting to see activity levels pick up again. And I think the thing that's really interesting, Justin, when we talk about the different operators and some of the successes there, is that the well results are really impressive. Some of these long lateral wells that have, you know, two mile horizontal segment have EURs that are up to 24 BCF per well, and then 24 BCF that means 24 billion cubic feet of gas per well. Uh, so there's a lot of gas that's produced. And to put it in perspective, just you know, nearby, there's the Eagleford Formation in South Texas. And the reserves for each of these wells in the Haynesville, from a gas perspective, is around two times those Eagleford wells. So they're really, really productive wells. And the other thing that it's got going for it is because of the depth and just the way that it's situated geologically, the wells are overpressured. And so this means that they don't have to put it on to artificial lift right away. They produce more gas up front in that first year. And then they do have, though, a very steep decline after that. So there's a, you know, pros and cons associated with that. The pros are that by producing more in the first year, it actually means operators see a quicker payout. Uh, and a higher return for uh, investors due to the time value of money. So if you're getting that initial investment back quicker, that means your return is, is higher. Now, on the flip side of that, because it does have a very steep decline, you see there's some challenges from an infrastructure point of view and from a facilities point of view. I know when I was on the operations side, we had to balance the initial rate of these wells coming on with the permanent facilities you would install on the well pad. And so there's some games that have to be played with how you bring wells on and the equipment that you have on the well pad and things like that, just to make sure that you're not what's called backing in other wells that are, that are producing. And so you have to have the right amount of compression and things like that to allow the, the wells to, to produce when you have these really, really high pressure, high volume wells coming online when you, when you drill a new well. But all of that said, that's all manageable. And, you know, the trade-offs around expensive to drill because of the depth versus you get the money back quickly. So there's, you know, 
some benefits in, into that. And what Chesapeake has said, one of the major operators in the Haynesville still, and they claim, and so you got to take this with a grain of salt since they have, are going through bankruptcy. But, you know, if you believe what they say, the break-even price is around $2.25 per MCF. You know, right now, as we sit today, looking at Henry Hub prices, yesterday closed at $2.69. So in theory, these wells would be profitable at current prices. So I think that's why you're starting to see drilling activity pick up. So Justin, why don't you tell us a little bit about some of those operators that are active in the Haynesville and some of the history there? Sure, absolutely. It'd be interesting to know if that Chesapeake number is true. That's a, a pretty low break-even point. It'd be impressive if it is. So speaking of assets changing hands, here are a few of the notable transactions. BHP purchased Petrohawk Haynesville assets in 2011. BP acquired these assets in 2018 when they purchased BHP's oil and gas interest. There's a lot of B and P's in that, that one there. In Canna, now Oventive was one of the major players in the Haynesville, but they sold their assets to GEP Haynesville, LLC. Shell sold its Haynesville assets in 2014 to Vine Oil and Gas. And in 2016, Anadarko sold the East Texas Haynesville asset to Castleton Commodities International. Castleton also purchased BG U.S. production company assets from Shell at the end of 2019. Former British gas interest in Haynesville is what those were. Castleton Commodities is owned by Tokyo Gas America LTD. And Aethon Energy Management purchased QEP resources interest in Haynesville in 2019. To take a look at the top operators by natural gas production, uh, we went to Well Database. Here are a few highlights for cumulative gas production since 2012 uh, when the play really started to boom. Chesapeake, BP, Comstock, and Vine have more than a TCF of gas produced from the Haynesville since 2012. The top five operators here, Chesapeake, Comstock Oil and Gas, Vine Oil and Gas, Indigo Minerals, and EXCO Operating Company. And Matt, these numbers are as of 2012, is that correct? Yeah, that was as of 2012. So these are wells drilled since January 1st, 2012. Just to put it uh, perspective, the recent activity, there was that period from 2008 to around 2012 when operators were starting to explore and delineate. And, and now they went in, after 2012, they went into full development mode and started to drill a lot more wells. And so that's just why we wanted to put it in perspective there. So like Justin said, the most impressive thing to me is the amount of gas that's been produced since then. And those operators, uh, like you mentioned, that have produced more than a TCF of gas, and that's more than a trillion cubic feet of gas uh, cumulatively from the Haynesville since 2012. And so there was, again, uh, four companies that we saw, uh, again, trying to aggregate together the various different operating companies that all fall under, like BP, for example, there's BPX operating and BP. So we combine those together and that was around 1.1 1 .1, uh, TCF. And so uh, long story short, a lot of gas and uh, not a whole lot of oil though, looking at this chart. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, makes it such an asset for heating people's homes. The Haynesville is one play that has received more attention as of late with a positive outlook for natural gas prices. In fact, there were 40 drilling rigs running in the area as of November 17th, 2020, here are a few of those top operators still drilling. Rockcliffe Energy Operating, Atheon Energy Operating, Burlington Resources Oil and Gas Company, and EOG Resources, Sabine Oil and Gas, Marathon Oil Company, and then Comstock Oil and Gas. So interesting to know that there's still activity running in those areas. And, and like you said, Matt, with the prices where they are, if they can break even, why wouldn't they? Yeah, I mean, and the fact that they're running multiple rigs, those names of those operators that Justin mentioned are all running two or more rigs. Uh, there's a handful of others that are running one rig. So there's 40 rigs total, but, you know, a handful of companies that are not just, you know, trying to keep a rig busy and sort of weather the downturn, they're actually starting to pick up activity. And so, you know, it'd be interesting to see, and I'll put this in the show notes, but I was wondering what the rig count in the Haynesville has done this year over time. I wonder if it's how much it's picked up. So I'll try to look into that and put a chart in the show notes. Uh, we'll, we'll do some research on Well Database and see what they have. But uh, Justin, you want to talk about specifically where the activity is happening uh, in the Haynesville, the main counties or parishes? Sure. As far as where the drilling's occurring, it's really in three main counties, Cato, DeSoto, parishes in Louisiana, and Panola County, Texas. Each have six or more rigs running right now. 
Several other counties have a few rigs running as well, but this seems to be where most of the activity is centered. In closing, one of the most notable things about the Haynesville in looking at the names of these companies is how many private companies are active in the gas play, and on top of that, how many smaller operators there are too. When you look at a lot of the major basins and plays that we've talked about, uh, there are a lot of larger publicly traded companies. There are definitely quite a few large public companies in Haynesville, but a lot of the public companies sold their Haynesville assets to private companies, as we mentioned earlier, which is very interesting. It'd be interesting to see if they seek to reacquire those. Yeah, you wonder now if they're having uh, seller's remorse. Uh, it's interesting looking at these names. There's some companies that I've never even heard of that have at least one rig running right now. Just looking at this chart. Uh, from Well Database again, we have Jeems Bayou Production, Pine Wave Energy Partners, let's see, Strand Energy, Blue Dome Operating, Markham and Russ, Sponte Operating. So really, uh, you know, small mom and pop operators still very active here. And then, of course, you have the big guys too, like we mentioned, but pretty diversified play in terms of the size and whether the company is private or public. But certainly the thing that stood out to me was the larger number of private small operators that are, are drilling in the Haynesville. So uh, let's talk now a little bit about the economic risk. So when we talk about economic risk, it really boils down to commodity prices. And with natural gas being in focus, again, we, we have this background for 2020 where the price of oil has dropped significantly. Operators have generally stopped drilling new oil wells in 2020 with a few exceptions. And as a result, you're seeing a drop in production, both oil production, but then also a drop in natural gas production. And this is because a lot of these oil wells produce what's called associated gas. And associated gas is basically just the natural gas that's produced, you know, along with the oil in a predominantly oil uh, well. And as we stop drilling these new oil wells, we have less natural gas coming online as well. And this is a very predominant in the Permian Basin where there is a significant amount of associated gas. Uh, so the good thing about that is it sort of bolstered prices for natural gas in 2020 because production has come down so much. And then on top of that, we have uh, an improving macroeconomic picture. You know, countries are starting to recover from the coronavirus pandemic, at least the first shock to the, uh, the economic system. Uh, we have LNG exports. So we have talked in the past about oil exports. Well, natural gas is also something that is being exported in the U.S. through what's called liquefied natural gas. And that's where they have a large plant where they take the gas from gaseous form. They liquefy it under uh, you know, temperature and pressure to get it down cold and, and into liquid form. And then they can load it onto a tanker and then send it to Asia or wherever. And it was interesting to me that uh, Tokyo Gas had purchased an interest in those properties in the former um, BG interests that Shell sold to Castleton Commodities International, which uh, Tokyo Gas America has an interest in uh, the Castleton Resources, which was the is the operator. So Tokyo, you know, they don't have a whole lot of uh, natural gas there in Japan, and so Japan is looking at how do they have a source, a reliable source of natural gas. And so they've invested in some of these assets to hopefully provide a supply. Uh, and then with these LNG exports, you know, we'll talk about that here in a second and the outlook for that. But there are quite a few LNG terminals that are close to the Haynesville Shale, uh, you know, along the Gulf Coast. So that's a positive. And another thing that is happening, you see this each year, you have the residential heating impact on the price of natural gas. And it just is a cyclical thing. And as we have cold winters, price of natural gas will go up over the winter. And then we'll generally come back down a little bit over the summertime. But as we draw from pipelines and from supply that we have, and the thing that's helping natural gas prices right now is we have a pretty good balance from a supply and demand standpoint. So that's why we've seen gases pop up over $3 an MCF, uh, at least for a time period. And uh, they've come down a little bit since then, but still natural gas is up quite a bit in uh, 2020 so far here in November. So going forward, uh, generally, I think you hear of a bullish forecast for natural gas. So from an economic risk standpoint, um, that's good. 
the thing on the downside of that, there's always the risk that you have uh, some geopolitical issue or, you know, you have some, uh, you know, environmental or sustainability um, headwinds on the industry as a whole that could impact negatively uh, the demand for natural gas. The good thing for natural gas that I'll say is it is sort of considered one of the bridge fuels as we go to this low carbon energy future. You know, it's more acceptable that you're going to burn natural gas to generate electricity, certainly compared to oil or coal. So that could help, you know, operators and could help uh, with the price and demand of, of natural gas. Now, speaking of that, that relates to the political risk. And we talk locally in Texas and Louisiana from a big picture standpoint, there's low what's called ESG risks or the uh, actual environmental or social or governance type risks that are talked about. And, you know, environmental at the state and local level is, is pretty low. Louisiana is um, pretty favorable to the oil and gas industry, Texas as well. Uh, the people in these local communities a lot of times own the mineral rights. And so they're wanting to see drilling activity and they want to see, you know, wells get put in and so that they can start getting royalties. And then a lot of the people there in those communities also work in the industry. So it's a huge part of the local economies. So if that's from like a social standpoint, you know, high level of local employment, you know, in that Ainsville area. Now, national politics also come into play. And like we've talked about a couple of times with respect to Biden's uh, energy plans is, you know, it's likely that you're going to see more federal regulations of greenhouse gas emissions around climate change and a focus on energy transition and stimulating uh, green energy, so to speak. And so there are those sort of political headwinds that are, are underlying really any activity in the industry right now. But with respect to where you're going to drill, if you're going to go and have the choice to drill a natural gas well in the Piance Basin in Colorado, where there's significant uh, regulatory changes coming versus drilling a natural gas well in the Haynesville, all things being equal, you may end up deciding to drill that well in the Haynesville just because of the lower risks, at least a perceived risk uh, from that standpoint. So you know, we'll, we'll see what happens, you know, the social side of things, there's definitely on the national level, more resistance to fossil fuels. Uh, before we hit record, we were talking about how uh, Great Britain has set a target. I think it was either 2030 or 2035 to basically stop the sale of gas or diesel powered vehicles, or at least vehicles that were strictly, you know, with an internal combustion engine. Uh, they are, are, I think, going to allow hybrid sales still, but you know you have things like that as well as California recently banning new natural gas appliances in new homes. Uh, so that was uh, that's pretty interesting that they're even with natural gas being a clean burning fuel, they're wanting to reduce that dependence on on natural gas or fossil fuels. So you know if more states decide to do similar things, that could uh, impact the demand for natural gas in terms of heating or for natural gas appliances in the home. So hopefully that won't happen because I think it really should be up to the consumer to decide which is the most efficient and effective way for them to heat their home or to cook their uh, boil water or whatever it is. But uh, that is happening. Um, just you know, a couple of things before we talk about the outlook. And we talked about infrastructure briefly. And so the thing that bodes well for the Haynesville is that it is very close. Do you hear about the Henry Hub price? Well, it's close to Henry Hub. And so that is, it's easy to get the gas to market is what that means. And so you have good pipeline capacity uh, for the most part, it obviously depends on how rapidly activity comes back to the Haynesville. But uh, in general, good infrastructure. We also have uh, just a lot of LNG export terminals nearby in the Gulf Coast. And so there are ways for operators to get their gas to market both domestically via Henry Hub or to send it to an LNG terminal to export it to Asia or to Europe or uh, Africa or wherever. So the thing that's pretty cool about that is it really has a lot of offers a lot of flexibility and it also helps with price. So and so like NYMEX natural gas prices when you look at 
the closing price for natural gas for the day. It's usually the NYMEX price. So it's not like we've talked about in the past with the Permian Basin, the Waha Hub. Usually that's a significant discount. You get usually uh, 20, 30, 40, even more percent discount to uh, NYMEX just because of issues with gas takeaway capacity in West Texas. Uh, you don't have that issue as much here. Now, when we look at LNG exports, like I mentioned, I found a forecast on Heart Energy's website, and they were talking about, you know, obviously we've talked here on this episode, Haynesville is one of the most important basins for LNG exports, again, just due to that proximity to those terminals. The thing that they were saying, though, is that it depends on the level of activity and what they're forecasting in a Henry Hub environment of $2.20 to $2.40, the running rate of activity is around 30 horizontal wells per month in the medium term. And they're saying that that level delivers almost a perfect match with maintenance requirements, with production remaining close to 12.5 BCF per day during 2020 to 2023. Now, the thing that you would see, though, is if you do have higher gas prices, then we're likely to see production growth continue in the Haynesville as operators chase those higher prices. Now, as you have prices in the $2.70 to $3 range, they're saying that activity would increase to around 40 wells per month, which is uh, would add around 3 BCF per day um, before the end of 2023. Again, you have the balance of these very steep decline as well as, you know, this continuous production or continuous drilling activity to sort of balance that out to keep levels flat or to even start to grow. And put in perspective the current activity level and where it could go, in the end of 2017, you were seeing around um, 120 wells per quarter. Uh, which was pretty consistent with what we're with what they're forecasting in the two to two seventy to three dollar Henry Hub range. Now, if you see prices go up again, we'll we'll see more wells drilled likely, and if you see prices go down, we'll see fewer. So, you just have to keep an eye on what natural gas prices do, and uh, and stay tuned to the investor presentations for a lot of these publicly traded companies. And in fact, BP. Uh, just in October of 2020, had a pretty bullish outlook on the Haynesville and Bernard Looney. And we've talked about BP as well and how they're really focused on net zero by 2050. And so it was really interesting to read their perspective on natural gas. And they still see natural gas as a key in bridging the gap to that net zero future. And they were they were bullish on LNG exports, sort of unlike that hard energy article that I just referenced. They were seeing that that actually is going to be a big boost to prices and to demand. And the fact that the recount is so low that they see an advantage in taking advantage of prices that are going to be forecasted to be over $3 in 2021 and prices that are even potentially higher in Europe and Asia. And so they can leverage that spread in gas prices here from the U.S. And if they can export it to Europe and Asia and get more for it, then uh, that's the the benefit of the Haynes builders. They have access to those LNG terminals. And in fact, Looney said, we've got a fantastic position in the Haynesville shale in the United States, probably one of the premium gas resources in the U.S., which is in proximity to the Gulf Coast export market with high pressure wells, you'll see us increasing activity there to take advantage of the situation. So if you are leased by BP, that could be uh, some good news. Justin, what do you think? Yeah, absolutely. And it, you know, it seems like uh, if natural gas is going to be the bridge to a smaller carbon footprint, the Hayesville has a lot of opportunity. I think so. Yeah. And the fact that it's dry gas, there's not a lot of those um, those natural gas liquids. It's relatively easy to process to get it into a uh, saleable form as natural gas. And so, uh, so yeah, a lot of things going for the Haynesville and, and certainly uh, I think it's going to continue so long as natural gas is uh, in the spotlight. So that just about does it for this episode. And thanks again for listening. And if you wouldn't mind leaving us an honest rating and review on Apple Podcasts. 
we would greatly appreciate it. It really helps us reach everybody that needs to hear this information. And make sure you subscribe there or wherever you're listening to this as well so that you can stay up to date on the latest in mineral rights and royalties world. So thanks again, Justin. Thanks, Matt. Thanks so much for listening to the Mineral Rights Podcast with your host, Matt Sands. Don't forget to subscribe and share at mineralrightspodcast.com. The Mineral Rights Podcast should not be construed as investment, legal, or tax advice. All information is believed to be from reliable sources. However, we make no representation as to its completeness or accuracy.